So, okay, we're going to talk about pitching a podcast. I'm assuming, are you guys already podcasters, wannabe podcasters? Where are you? I'm just trying to read the room. Beginning stages? Got it, got it, yeah. What about you guys? I'm 77 episodes now. Oh, man, what's your show? Pittsburgh Nerd. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. I'm going to look that up. That's awesome. Even better is our logo. <laughs> I got to see this. Oh, that's awesome. Yes, it's a microphone, just for my Oh, yeah, that's yeah. It's the RCA 7 yeah. It's a great mic. Um, Two episodes in. Okay. Bird Life FM. Awesome. Cool. That's great. The Rambling Movie Minute. Rambling uh, Movie Minute. Yeah, I got those with Mike. Uh, sorry. Okay. We're just talking about movies. Like new movies, old movies? Yeah, like current movies. Okay. About. Yeah, but I'm looking to start a new one, so... All right. So, um, I'm, you know, anything that I talk about, I mean, it sounds like you guys are pretty experienced. You can be like, whatever, you know, but I know it's being recorded and then maybe somebody can use it later, you know? So, um, yeah, my name's, uh, Kate Daly and you'll see right there the, the 55 RCA 77. Um, my ex-husband has an on an analog recording studio and he has a bunch of Neumanns and he has this exact mic and some really beautiful microphones. So I use his equipment as part of our divorce agreement <laughs> for my show, simply because we played in a band together for several years and it's very amicable. So I understand that my situation is different because I have access to like this really cool stuff, but um, that is actually not the mic that I want to ideally use for my show. Um, what I have right now is I borrowed an SM57 from him, which I know is okay, it's a 57, it's fine, but, um, I'm trying to think of the name, it's the, um, I'll look at it, it's in my notes, but it's, it's the bigger one, it's the, the bigger one. I'm not sure, what mics do you guys use? Uh, right now I'm using an iRig microphone in my iPhone. Sweet. But That's we do awesome. have Blue Yetis, I'm trying to learn how to use. Oh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of the folks on, on Good Stuff actually use those. Yeah. That's cool. And you guys? I have a silver Yeti. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I can't remember what they're called. I have four of them. I bought them on Amazon. Like I should know, too. Miles, and so I will totally they're, look it up. They're actually but good quality. There's one yeah. that makes you sound nice. like you're on NPR. And that's what I want. Like, yeah. I want the NPR voice. I want to be <laughs> Nina Totenberg minus 20 years. <laughs> so, okay. So here I am online. I'm at, at TPK. And my new show is NSFW PM because it is a project management podcast. I'm a professional project manager and I work for an agency and we are based out of DC and we do web design. And um, I have, in an ironic way, used shortcuts on my slides. I was an English major, I am a writer, I am a blogger. I think that that's funny because I'm doing it ironically. I'm not a high school kid who thinks that that's how you spell about. So you'll see that throughout all of this. And uh, I don't want you to think that I'm like an idiot. So, <laughs> But um, my deal is that I worked for a not-for-profit here in Pittsburgh for about 12 years. And that was the Oncology Nursing Society. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It's actually the second largest not-for-profit in the Pittsburgh area. And there I was a copy editor. And then because I taught myself HTML for the band that I was in, I made a little green website for my band. Um, they took me onto the tech team because they said, why is a copy editor writing HTML? So they took me onto their team and then eventually I became a project manager there. I've come to learn that project management is very different everywhere you go. And part of that was why I decided that I wanted to start having a dialogue so my, my deal is that after I left that job, because I've been there for a long, long time, I calculated it, and at the time I left, it was like a third of my life I had spent at this company. And an opportunity came my way to work at an agency. I don't know if you guys work at agencies or are hip to that kind of culture, but it's totally nuts. And hey there. Hey. Hey. I'm Kate. Sean. I'm just talking about my deal. And um, <clears throat> agency life, I mean, a lot of people make jokes about it. There's a lot of burnout there, and it's it can be very hectic. 
just today when I was finishing up my slides, I got a call from a technical director telling me that we had a production issue with one of the client's servers. So I had to like get all these people together, call a guy down in Atlanta, talk to other people in DC, some people are traveling, and get all these people together on a Sunday morning. And, you know, it's not always like that, but agency life can be tough. And the other thing about my new role, I've been there 11 months now, is that I noticed that there were, hey there, there were folks who treated project managers like administrative assistants. Like there's the people who believe the project manager is there to schedule the meetings, make sure that everybody's at the meetings, and take the notes. And then there are project managers like I found myself becoming where I would talk to my clients and I would do more strategic work. And when I started to notice that difference, I wanted to talk about that difference. And so I started talking to my coworkers about it. I'd be like, does everybody else live in spreadsheets but me? And you know, like what about this huge issue that we had with QA? Why wasn't that discovered when the other guy was managing this project? Well, the other guy was in a spreadsheet all day, making, you know, tracking the budget to the penny so that he could give these budget reports to the client on, you know, the exact second every week. Me? Me? You know, it's, it's accurate, but I care more about stuff like making sure that the team is communicating with each other, making sure that stuff isn't broken all of the time, and by broken I don't just mean the servers, I mean, you know, the planning the uh, communication between the devs and the QA guys. So I started to have these conversations with, a lot with my coworkers, but also with my clients. And I decided that, you know, if I can have these conversations on the phone, and it's important to note that I work here in Pittsburgh, my agency is in DC. So I am alone on my porch with my cell phone and my computer all day long. So every single conversation I have, except for when I'm in, on site with a client or the occasional times I go down to DC, I'm on the phone. So I found myself having these long conversations and I kept thinking, I wish this was recorded because this is so good. You know, people need to talk about this stuff. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe I can have a show. But then I thought, well, you know, why don't I have no idea what I'm going to do. And I am a total noob when it comes to listening to podcasts. I have friends who are like, oh, do you listen to Dan Savage all the time? I'm like, no, I love Dan Savage, but I don't listen to his show. And then I have friends who are just like, oh, but all those NPR podcasts. And I'm like, I just listen to it on the radio. <laughs> you know, like, I don't, podcasting was new and foreign to me. But about a year ago, kind of around the same time I got my new agency gig, I came across this show called The Intellectual Radio Program. And it's these three dudes, one who's in Saskatoon, uh, Saskatchewan, and then another one who I think is in Tennessee. He's probably watching this live stream. He's like, I can't And then Tim, I'm not sure where Tim is, but they're all over the country. You know, they're in Canada and the U.S. And I would listen to their show every week on Good Stuff FM. Well, at the time, it was on SSKTN which was a Saskatoon-based podcasting network that one of the three dudes, Chris, had set up. And so I would listen to this every week, and every time when I missed it, I felt like I missed out on my buddies. So they would stream it live, and they'd have a chat room. So I eventually got brave enough to like go in the chat room and like make jokes, and when people responded to the jokes and laughed, I was like, okay. Like I felt like I was kind of like in their little group. And so the other cool thing that they do is that they ask the audience to submit show title ideas. So part of what you do in this chat room is suggest the show title idea and then it automatically goes to a voting website. So when one of my titles got chosen, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. So I uh, always listen to TERP. That's the, the acronym for the show. And then I started listening to a morning show called Transmission with these two brothers, Kenny and Kyle. And they reminded me so much of the Car Talk guys that I loved it because I've been a longtime NPR fan. I had a Steve Inskeep button that I used to wear everywhere. And nobody knows who Steve Inskeep is except the people who do. And then they're like, that is so weird and cool that you have that. 
I'm like, thank you. So, um, because the, the two podcasts that I was listening to were live shows, um, I decided, you know, maybe I could contact these good stuff guys and see if they'll want to use my stuff. So a lot of people at the time were like, well, why don't you just blog about it, Kate? You write all the time. And that's cool. I can blog. I do. I still blog. Um, but it was the dialogue that I craved. And it was the immediacy of it that I craved. Even though I wasn't somebody who, you know, ha had subscribed to 20 podcasts, I still knew that there was an audience for it and that people were craving that kind of content. So, I decided to pitch it. And this was a long process for me. But what I decided to do was write it, because that's what I do. I contacted Chris, who is probably my closest friend out of the three dudes on Terp. I was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing a show. What do you guys think? And he's like, well, write it up and pitch it to us. So let me switch over real quick to this. This is what I wrote for the dudes at Good Stuff. I'm going to be publishing this on Medium in pretty much its entirety pretty soon because I want to get it out there because I think it's valuable. But basically what I did was wrote this manifesto of sorts, you know, describing myself, describing what I do, trying to add some cred, saying that I'd had some funny tweets once and that I have cute children and I work somewhere and that I'm in a band and that I was loosely affiliated with their network already because I was a listener, and I had been interviewed for their newsletter. So I'm like, I'm not just a stranger off the street. Like, I'm somebody that you kind of know, sort of. So I went through, and again, we're not going to read through this, but I went through and explained in detail, probably excruciating detail, why I wanted to you know, one of the things that is going to be unique about my show as a whole is that it is a show about project management. I mean, who the hell wants to talk about project management? I do. But I believe that when you're talking about being a PM, we are PMs of our lives. I'm a mom. I'm a single mom. I've got two kids. They're eight and six. And I have to manage their lives all the time from the cereal to the baseball practice to you know, Millie asking me once a week to sign her up for karate, and yes, I will someday. But, you know, like, I, I wanted to do this and not just talk about work, but I also wanted everybody to be raw. I speak a lot. I'm a public speaker. And it's interesting. The first time I was watching someone speak and heard them say fuck in front of the audience, I was like, oh, my God. How it's going to happen with that. But then I realized, no, 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 no. We are all adults in this room, and that's okay. So what I told these guys is like, hey, I want people to be able to be very raw on this. But I also want people to feel comfortable and not feel like they have to say, oh, I work with this agency, and here are my clients that you might know. Because I want people to not feel that they have to disclose where they are unless it makes them interesting. I didn't want anybody to feel weird about talking about weird clients because they're afraid they're going to get fired. And what I did is I went to the people of my company and I said, hey guys, I'm going to have a podcast about project management and it's going to be NSFW. And they were like, awesome. And I couldn't believe it. Because I thought that like my HR department would be weird. You know, I thought everybody might be a little weird about that. But it's actually working out. And I think part of that has to do with that, you know, people, you know, swearing and podcasting, it kind of goes together, and so does being an adult. It doesn't matter. I did, you know, field research looking at other networks. I have nothing to worry about. You know, I don't know why I felt like I was, like, 12, worried about swearing. So, like I said, I'm going to get this posted out there, and it's... It's lengthy, but um, it's pretty interesting. So what I wanted to do 
was figure out what my voice was going to be. In my pitch, I used the same kind of language I'm going to use on the show, the same kind of tone that I'm going to use on the show. And I think that kind of consistency helped the guys at Good Stuff understand what they were getting into by telling me, yes, come and be on our network. But the other thing that I need to do is decide, is this only going to be a podcast for people in technology? Like, I've heard a lot of people say recently that, you know, the whole dudes talking about Apple products <laughs> is dead. Now, I mean, maybe it is. Maybe people still want to listen to dudes talk about Apple products. That's fine. It's interesting, I think, at times, but I'm not a dude. I'm not going to be talking about Apple products is my main thing. Hey, guys. Hey, good to see you again. And, you know, I wanted the network to understand that I'm not just going to target project managers, not at all. I'm not going to target people in technology at all. I'm going to target people like my mom. You know, people like my dad, who's an engineer and has to do some kind of project management every day. I think everybody does. And, you know, you can take almost any situation and apply it to that kind of framework. One of the things that I'm planning for my show is, I, I watch movies a lot, which is why I was really interested when you said that you did that. Um, the movie Jaws, in my opinion, is a perfect project management tale. Because poor Chief Brody is a PM with a stakeholder in that mayor guy, and I can't remember his name, who continually undermines what he does. He says, we gotta close the beaches. And the mayor says, for only a day. And he, Brody knows somebody's gonna get killed if you only close the beaches for a day. But he has to bow to the power of this stakeholder who's running the town, who doesn't want to shut everything down for the 4th of July weekend. So, you know, I, I think that realizing that, you know, project management is everywhere. It's in movies, it's in our lives, it's in our kitchens. You know, helps grow the audience of people who will be into what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so your heroes. Uh, when, when I speak, I talk a lot about heroes. For one reason, when I was in college, I was an English major and very much into the hero myth that Joseph Campbell wrote. And, um, you know, he worked on that for his whole life, you know, defining what the hero is. And the archetypal hero that Joseph Campbell describes is, is Luke Skywalker, but it's also Buddha, but it's also Christ, but it's also the kid in Stand By Me. They all go through the same kind of trajectory. And for me, my heroes when it comes to this stuff is Terry Gross, Howard Stern, and, you know, these people that I, Paul Harvey is a huge one for me. Listening to Paul Harvey growing up on these long road trips to Erie was my favorite thing. I loved it. And Art Bell. Do you guys ever listen to Art Bell? He's nuts. But I loved it. You know, he does this, like, late night thing, coast to coast with Art Bell. Yeah. Talks, yeah. Is he dead now? I don't know if he's dead, but I think he's completely retired. They, they run, Did they give it to somebody else? George Norrie has it now. <clears throat> and uh, same format. Same format, same, same conspiracy same, yes, theories, same, same contrails. Everything. Yeah. He's always talking uh, about contrails. But they run the old Art Bells on the weekends <gasps> sometimes. I love and it. And around Halloween, they always run Ghost to Ghost. <laughs> okay, so when I first moved to Pittsburgh, I had a moment... When I had gotten, I worked at Borders, making like pennies an hour, like five thirty-five an hour. I could barely pay my rent, and but I was living in Pittsburgh, and that's cool. And you know, I was selling knowledge, all that BS. But I would work until eleven o'clock at night, and then sometimes like go out for a bit afterwards. And I remember a time that I was sitting in my car on Belf Avenue, terrified to get out of my car because of what I was listening to <laughs> on our bell, and it was something about. It was ghosts. It was totally ghosts. And he had all this evidence. And I remember just like sitting there like kind of frozen because I was afraid to like walk up my steps. But um, I love that. And the funny thing is about these guys, and I'll get to talking about sponsors, how naturally do they do the sponsor reads? Like when you're listening to these shows, Stern does it, and um, you know, Art did it, and Paul Harvey did it really well. 
There's commercials during all that, which you know because they're talking about a product, but they do it really naturally. And I try to like emulate that when I'm doing my sponsor reads. So, your friends, and not just your friends, your cool contacts. What I did before I pitched my show is I talked to people that I knew would be into it. I talked to a lot of local guys, and I talked to people that I've met at conferences. And my big one that I'm so excited about, because I'm a project management nerd, is a guy named Alistair Coburn, because he is one of the signers of the Agile Manifesto. He is in Pittsburgh kind of regularly for some reason, and I didn't, I mean, it, this was amazing because I came across his writing, and I was like, oh, this is so perfect. It's like changing how I look at my job. And then I realized that he was gonna be speaking here in Pittsburgh, and that people associated with the Pittsburgh Agile Group actually knew him. So, Alistair and I have corresponded via email and I have a couple text messages from him that I'm totally saving. And, but every time he's been speaking, I've been really sick. So I don't know if this is like not destined to happen or whatever, but he has agreed to be on my show. And I'm so excited. So, but finding people who you know are gonna be game for a good conversation whether you're talking about project management or I'm gonna be maybe talking to like guys who are designers. I have a plan to talk to my eight-year-old son because he surprises me sometimes with his like insight when it comes to this stuff. He was at school and they had to work in teams and make brochures. And when I went to their little presentation, I said, so tell me about your challenges with this. And they said, well, we had to decide who's gonna do what and whose stuff was gonna go first. And I'm like, that's what I do at my job, guys. <laughs> and like these eight-year-olds were like, uh-huh. But they don't realize that that's the kind of skills they're learning and that that's like what you do on a daily basis when you're trying to manage any project, not even a web project. So sponsors, I touched on this earlier. Um, Good Stuff FM has a couple main sponsors. One is Campaign Monitor. One is um, Mandrel. The, uh, it's like the transactional email thing that MailChimp does. And um, that's cool. And I've been able, when I do my show, like read the sponsor read. They're very flexible with it where I just, there's some certain things I need to say, but I can also frame it to my voice. And that's really exciting. I'm looking for sponsors on my own because I think that that'll not only add to the bottom line of the network, but I'm looking for ones that will kind of jive with what I'm doing. My favorite one that I'm going to reach out to, and if you're listening, I'm calling you, um, Shitty Notebook. Have you guys heard about this? They're, they make these little notebooks, these beautiful little notebooks, which I think are so important to carry around with to put your ideas in them, and it's for all your shitty ideas. So there's my, there's my plug for Shitty Notebook. They're having a sale right now, so if you go to shittynotebook.com, you can get like what's normally a six dollar product for maybe five. But so I mean, I don't know. Do you guys have sponsors for your shows? How do you do that? Yeah, it's interesting, and I don't know if that's unique to being on a network or what. You know, because and I don't even know like what the legal contract would look like, like what the money goes and stuff. If there's money, I don't want money. I just want to talk about stuff. So, um, gear. Before a lot of you guys were here, I started talking about this. Um, the RCA 77 that you see on all the slides, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful and iconic microphones. And um, I am using simply whatever that free thing is that comes with, with what's it called? Band? The, the free thing that comes on a Mac. Yeah, that one. I know. Are you wincing? No. Oh, okay. I thought you were well, wincing. Well, I, I am kind of because it's <clears throat> just kind of sucks. Level microphone, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm using GarageBand with an SM57 right now, but then I have to look in that pitch that I had up there for the microphone that I want to borrow from my ex-husband. So I don't know if you were in here when I was talking about him. Okay. So here's the deal with me. Um, I was married to this dude, and we were in a band for a really long time. He has an analog recording studio in his house. He has one of those big, like, 
boards with 32 channels. He has tape machines. He has a quarter inch. He has a half inch. He has a one inch tape machine in his house. He has like all of these Neumann mics. He has all of these RCA mics. He has all the mics that you see. If you watch the movie Ray, that has so many gratuitous mic shots. All the mics you see in the movie Ray with Jamie Foxx, my ex-husband owns. So what I did is I was like, hey, Bill, you got all this stuff and you're not really recording that much because, I mean, analog recording is great, I guess, but it's really expensive and uh, everybody can do it with Bandcamp where they can go and buy Logic, which is worth the money, or they can go get Pro Tools, which if you want to, but um, analog recording, although I totally believe in the value of it, and yes, I can hear the difference, and yes, do I love vinyl, all that stuff. You know, his mics sit in their fancy cases in the log cabinet a lot. And I thought, if I have access to this stuff, eh, I'm going to use it. So, as I got this together, my friend, Carrie, has a new show, also on the same network, called I Guess for Grownups Now. And Carrie and I were, were buddies. She's awesome. And she asked me to be a guest on her show. And this was a huge moment in my preparation for this because I'd never been a guest on anybody's show. And, you know, like, like I said, I speak a lot. I'm in a band, so I play a lot, like on stage and stuff, but I don't, didn't know what it would be like to be in a one-on-one -on -one conversation that's recorded. So if you uh, find, I guess, for grown-ups now, episode five, which is about birth control, Carrie and I are on there having a very frank discussion about that, and it was an awesome experience because I felt really comfortable. Did I have a glass of wine at 2 o'clock in the afternoon so I could do this? Yes. And um, I don't know if I'll need a glass of wine every single time I record with a guest, but uh, maybe it helped the content with that, but it's really interesting and it was a really good experience. Was that in person or was that... <clears throat> no, she's in, she's in Saskatoon, Canada too. Oh, okay. So how did you record? Skype. Skype. Yeah. She had a fancy mic and was going into her thing. Oh, yes. Thank you for asking that question because I just was using like my earbud thingies mm -hmm. with the little mic on it. But, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a guest on a future show called Show Me Your Mic that's coming out soon where we talk about how to do that. Because also on Good Stuff, um, like a lot of them are audiophile nerds and podcasting nerds. So uh, they talk about podcasting, talk about gear. And on Show Me Your Mic, it's myself, Kyle, who's out in California, and Chris, who's up in Canada having a conversation about how to do that. And they used me because I'm such a noob. Because they, I don't know anything about anything. And so, <clears throat> I mean, other than like some basic understanding of it, you know, because I was around the studio, but I never understood like, you know, doing it digitally. I, you know, I understand like splicing tape and I understand channels and all that. But, um, so that's gonna be coming out probably within the next couple of weeks. So um, that's going to be a really informative show. So write it down, and this is where my, my shitty notebook comes in. And then I also carry around a field notes one, if you guys are into those. A plug for a tiny product. Um, I decided that the only way I could keep track of all of my thoughts, whether it's for my writing or for the show, that it it was that I had to carry these around. I mean, I can do it on my phone sometimes, but if I'm like, I was at a Catholic wedding in September, and I didn't want to be on my phone, like, writing stuff down, because people would think, like, why are you live-tweeting this wedding? You're a jerk. And, um, but I wasn't live-tweeting. I was, like, writing down notes for the show and for a blog that I wanted, blog post that I wanted to do about, like, the institution of marriage and all this stuff. And, um, but I found... <coughs> The biggest, you know, way to keep track of all that spinning, you know, all the spinning ideas is to write it down. I even recommend it to the developers I work with. And I've heard some people call it, like, your personal engineering notebook. Like, it actually has, like, a, an official name sometimes. 
you know, just keeping your own like little journal of stuff. And um, but I found that these are handy. I use Evernote all the time when I'm on my machine. And I do have a couple of notes on my phone, but I prefer analog notes, I guess. So when I went to record my first show, um, I did a solo show. And man, it was so weird because I had everything prepped. Like I had like notes for it. And I had magically uh, a day alone at my house. So I got everything set up and I plugged in the mic and I messed with the thingies like to like be like male podcasting voice, female. I didn't know what any of that meant, but I, whatever sounded right, I chose it. And I started recording and I got sick to my stomach nervous. I could not believe it. I speak in front of crowds all the time and I was in my dining room with a microphone and I was so nervous, I was shaking. What? I had to stop. I had to stop. And I was like, oh. like, like, like I, could, I could hear my voice like getting all wavery on the recording. So, so I was like, ah. And I like stopped and I was like, what is going on? I don't know. I can't explain what happened. And maybe I was like sick with the flu and I didn't know it again or something. But I'm just curious, is that common? Like, it is? Because I would rather like talk to people. Like, I will talk to the guy behind me on the moving walk at the airport. And I will do this. I, I used to do overnight radio, and I can't tell you how many people, when they came in, you're sitting in a box yeah. by yourself, yeah, and you know that 50,000 people are listening to you, but you can't see one of them. Yeah. You have no immediate feedback. Is that it? It was because of that. Mm. Thank you for giving me the words to describe what happened. Because I, it really caught me off guard. And it made me nervous. I was like, can I do this? Like, can I really do this? I signed up for this. I wrote those guys a seven page manifesto telling them that I would. I committed to this and I freaked out. And what I ended up doing is I re-recorded the intro stuff and then I, I didn't have a glass of wine, which I'm proud of, but I did just kind of go with it and I did try to picture people. I did. Well, you're, you're used to public speaking. Yeah. So you have people sitting out here, you're getting a response to what you're saying. Yes. Even if the audience is silent, you're getting a response. I'm getting a response. When you're in a box by yourself, <laughs> oh. there is no response. There is no feedback. It is unnerving. That is why it's so hard for comedians to record studio albums. Oh. That's Most really Most of the comedy albums you'll ever hear are live albums. They have to be. You're right. You're right. Group, groups that could do it well, Cheech and Chong, did studio albums really good. Wow. But they had each other. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And they had a lot of other stuff. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> so, so, you know, and, and I know, you know, you guys are experienced with this, and I, I thank you so much for that, like, way to frame that in my head, because it really and, you know, the majority of my shows are going to be dialogue, you know, at least, at least with me and at least one other person, maybe two other people, depending on the show. One of the ones I want to do, I'm so excited about this. Um, I have noticed a pattern that people who work in technology and are the best developers I have used to work at McDonald's. And I've seen it so many times because I guess when you're at McDonald's, like it's like the whole, like, if you have time to lean, you have time to clean. Those guys are the best devs I ever had. And when I have a good developer that I work with at work, I say, did you by chance work at McDonald's? And when they say yes, I'm like, yes, I knew it. Because, like, there's this one guy who is, like, at our agency, he's awesome. And I heard a story about him the other day that when he was in high school, he was, like, on, he was the guy who had to go open up the McDonald's at 5 a.m. Like, he probably had to get there at 4. He hit a deer, totaled his car, the airbags deployed, and he still went to work. And people were like, why did you do that? And he was like, I had to open. <laughs> and to me, like, like if I almost hit a deer, I wouldn't have gone to work. You know, like, you, you just don't, like, the, to think that somebody did that and that kind of dedication and the fact that they were displaying that kind of commitment when they were, you know, 17 and a half, like, those guys make 
awesome developers. And I want to talk to them. I want to get them all together because it's like from all different jobs and different experiences, these, these McDonald's guys. So I'm excited about that. So um, editing, I mean, yeah, like, I, I'm getting a little bit of help with this. I mean, like, that uh, I keep wanting to call it Bandcamp. Garage Band. I mean, it's really easy. But I just need to, like, dedicate myself to doing it. <laughs> and, um, like, I am going to have intro and outro music, but stuff from my previous band that we recorded. So it's, like, my own stuff. Or it's, like, my buddy's stuff. So, um, I don't know, do you guys use music for your stuff? And what do you do? Where do you get it? Yes. Do they have good stuff on there? Uh, not kind of. Yeah, it <laughs> depends on which worldly free site you go to. Some of them are really good and some of them are Is it like a snippet? No, or is it like a... You get whole songs. And you yeah. just type in, like, banjo. It gives you banjo? Okay. There's, there's Moody. Also, there, there was. I don't know if it's still open because I haven't done casting for a while. Um, there was a site that allowed bands to submit their music oh. for use on podcasts. Oh, that's totally cool. Maybe my bands should do that. And then you get like four cents or something every time. Well, it... no, you don't. Well, it's. <laughs> I have to say it's an exposure site, but it, uh, hey, I that's yeah. I don't know. That's where the X and I really differ. I say put your stuff out, let people download it, and he's like, no, we need a, a, an actual record album. Yeah, and I'm like, no. Even the, the coolest people I know don't have turntables right now. I, I think the the main thrust of, of a lot of it, at least with music that I've seen, is getting music out, letting people hear it, and say, yeah. hey, come to our website. Yeah. And I think that's how this site was set up, is that if you use the site from that, you know, you hey, I got this, and then in your yeah. show notes you put, here's the oh, okay. website. Oh, so, okay, that's totally cool. That seems like a deal. You know, and I mean, like my current band, we have an EP out. I'm not using my current band's music for my show, but I'm using my old band's music because we were a surf band. And I have a lot of, like, instrumental type things. So, um, yeah, it's editing. If you need help, there's a million dudes out there who can help you. Or learn it yourself. Yay. You know, I don't know. Does anybody use Boss Jock? I know Dave Mansueto, and I haven't done it yet. But I'm curious, and it seems to really have some cool tools on there. So then, um, tweet about it. You guys on Twitter? Probably everybody is, right? My mom's on Twitter. She's an egg. <laughs> and, um, but I have set up an account for the show, and I was excited that it had, like, people following it. And, full disclosure, my first show is going to be posted tonight. So, I mean, I was really hoping to do it this morning, but then I got the work call and I couldn't do it. <laughs> but I have, like, a followership on the NSFWPM thing, and it really made me happy. But you know how I got it? I um, There was a digital project management conference in October. And I started following that hashtag. And people were putting quotes out. And I found a site where people might not think this is funny. I thought it was funny. Where you could make um, fake gravestones. And so I made project management gravestones. <laughs> and when people would do a quote, I would put it on the gravestone with their Twitter handle and then send it back to them. And they loved it. I mean, I think everybody I did it to seemed appreciative with a fave or something. You know, like, nobody was like, that's sick. Stop that <laughs> shit. <laughs> but, um, so, like, when, it, when you're new, I guess, like, I thought it was just, I saw an opportunity for that and totally seized it, and it worked out. I mean, when I have the show up tonight, you know, I'll have a lot of support from the network and stuff for getting it out there. So... You know, I, I'm not too worried about that, but, you know, definitely putting together a, a Twitter handle for it, and a strategy in your mind. I mean, uh, this whole conference, I guess, is about social media strategy. I won't even, like, you know, spend a whole lot of time on that. But, um, 
I do have a lot of interesting ideas about that because I think that um, a lot of people feel like it has to be kind of formulaic where I feel like it's a little more organic, but then again, I'm not a brand. I don't know. I don't know. I ignore the brands on there. And the biggest and best advice I got from the guys at the network and from other people who were involved in this was even if you're not going to do a weekly show, commit to some kind of cadence with your show. And because doing a weekly show with me is going to be completely insane. I can't do that. I have too many um, unexpected things happen with my job and with my clients and my kids. I cannot commit to that. So I'm not going to want to commit to that because I don't want, you know, say I get an audience, I don't want to disappoint them by not having a weekly show. I do think, though, that having, like, I'm going to try to do it twice a month, and I want to try to stick to that, because it's going to keep me disciplined, and I'm not going to be like, yeah, well, it doesn't matter, this, uh, you know, like, I'll, if I don't commit to that, then I'm totally going to make excuses, and then I don't want it to fall apart. I don't want to disappoint the people who made an investment in me, and, you know, there's no monetary investment. They gave me a platform. They said, yes, your content can be on our network. So to me, I take that very seriously because it's an endorsement and it shows a lot of trust. So I also don't want to break their trust. So, you know, when I get these shows out there, you know, I'm going to do it on a scheduled basis. <coughs> and I think the best way for me to do that is to record a whole bunch of stuff in advance <laughs> so that I have something in the can should anything, should life happen. And, I mean, I think that that's where they keep doing it. Like, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I know sometimes, you know, there's live shows where there's, like, one person there, and there's, not, like, live shows when there's 100 people there. At my old job, they used to believe that every time we did, at the time, they were calling them webcasts or webinars, like, there would be, like, thousands of people. So they would be like, well, you have to get the contract that'll support 3,000. And I'd be like, there's going to be six nurses on this. No, oh, well, you never know. And there were six. Sometimes there were four. And it's funny, like, everybody's expectations were, like, blown out of the water. I mean, well, excuse me. They were not blown out of the water. They were extremely uh, optimistic. And I think having realistic op er, expectations when it comes to your numbers is wise. I don't know. I think it's going to be a hit show, so so we'll see. But that's it. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? I mean, we've kind of been talking throughout the whole thing. But um, here's my, whoops, that's the, the handle for myself, the show, and Good Stuff FM. And then here's some links where you can find some of the stuff that I've done if you're interested. I was the creative morning speaker in August, and that was a big deal. And there's why I write, I put all my stuff on Medium. I know a lot of people are like, why are you doing it there? Put it on your personal blog. I will put it on my personal blog, but everybody's, like, there's people reading Medium, so I'd rather just stick myself there. And um, the Pastry Box Project is um, a daily site. They publish one thought a day, uh, mostly designers and people in web development. But um, I've had a couple of thoughts posted on that, and that's also interesting because... There's a gentleman in Europe who runs this site, but also a woman here in Pittsburgh named Katie Watkins, who is one of the editors for this site. And it was really cool because I'd followed them for quite some time. And uh, when I found out that Katie was here in Pittsburgh, I was like, oh my god, this local connection. And now she's my friend and we go to Ives sometimes and buy comic books. She's the one, she turned me on to Hawkeye. Oh, yeah. Stuff. I know, right? So, um, okay, that's it. Any questions? Challenges? I do. Want to be a guest? I, I just checked. Yeah. Uh, it's called Podsafe Music Network. Podsafe Music Network. Let me put that I in my chain I can't pull it up on my phone, but that's what it is. Okay. I've, I've used them. They're pretty good. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Podsafe. Podsafe. P-O-D-S-A-F-E. Podsafe Music Network. Okay. Uh, Music Alley is also another one that, that came up. I'm not familiar with them. Okay. 
That's cool. I mean, I'm interested in it as a as a podcaster, but also as a musician. So, Music Alley. Music Alley was another one. Okay. I know uh, BBC releases stuff, but that subscription. Mm. But it's royal. It's royalty free. You, 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 Is it a nominal subscription? I don't know. I only if, have a subscription if it's nominal. I don't know if they're doing that. I mean, I when we worked when I was working in radio, this is before the internet. I mean, we yeah. were mid eighties when it was coming out, and we bought this whole huge library from the BBC. And I know they're still selling the library. Hmm. Um, of, uh, the sounds of sound effects and, and music ah. and loops and hits and wow. Um, Got one of the other DJs in trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, I was uh, working for a, a radio station, DIZ in Orlando. Okay. And um, when they executed Bundy. Oh yeah, totally. I, you know what? That's the only issue of the National Enquirer I ever bought. When they it was like ten o'clock in the morning, ten o seven in the yeah. morning, and um, I, he was playing Cabin in the night. And right in the middle, he had a cart. The eight track loop. Yeah. And he put it in the middle of the song, didn't close the song down, but right in the middle of the song it went, Snap, Crackle, Pop, Fry, Bundy. Oh. Pulled it out and erased the cart. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And they couldn't prove that he had actually done it. Because they erased the cart. Because he, he erased, erased the cart, and, and, and he not only erased it, but he taped over it like four times. Oh my God. That's crazy. I've not thought about 10 Bundy in years. Thank you for reminding me of Ted Bunny, but yes, I went to the shop and save and I bought that issue of the acquire that had his like photos. You, you, you Isn't it you gross? Were, you like why would I Howard, do that? You said you were a Howard Stern fan. Yes. Do you remember the song Howard was playing up to the execution? No. I wasn't Bye I, bye Ted Bunny, goodbye. <laughs> your are all over, now you're gonna cry. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I didn't get into Stern in time of Pittsburgh. So but they, they, Bundy's thing was like, what, 87, 88? Yeah. Yeah. And I moved to Pittsburgh in 97. So I even bought a serious subscription for a while to keep listening to him, and then I let it run out. You know, I got NPR. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Find me on the internet and uh, listen to my show when it comes out, like tonight. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and contact me if you're interested in being a guest or have ideas for the show or anybody else who would be cool.